welcome age of vintage society. Our identity is a crucial part of us, but Rita Hayworth lost her identity to attain success. As if that wasn't enough, Alzheimer's came to take away all that was left of her. How Rita Hayworth survived her father's obsession with her body. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Rita Hayworth, the Love Goddess What is the self? What makes you, you? Your identity, yourself, is a sum of where you are from, your skin colour, your hair, the shape of your lips, your smile, and even the way you walk. Everything about you forms part of your identity. Now imagine having to give all these up in bits and pieces. Imagine giving all of yourself up because you want to be successful. Cruel, isn't it? Yes, Hollywood was cruel to Rita Hayworth. The industry preyed on her desire to be successful and took everything that made her her. Be careful when you say you would give anything for success. You might end up giving everything and you would be left miserable, just like Rita was. After all, what is a success when you don't even know who you are any more? Her transformation wasn't easy, as you might have guessed, but no one can truly describe Rita's excruciating pain when changing her Latino hairline into an American one. The hairline changing process through electrolysis left her wincing with searing pain, and it took two years before completion. Under the watchful eyes of movie studios, Rita eliminated most traces of her ethnicity, down to her diet. She even had to endure a harsh exercise routine and a total change of hair colour. Out with the darkness and in with the auburn hair. All for what? She had to become the American girl with the exotic look, the dangerous American femme fatale who made the head of men turn and their loins hard with desire. Soldiers lined the walls of their barracks with pictures of this Americanized beauty. People propped her up, not caring she was a creation of greedy corporate executives. The real her had been smothered in glamour. It was the only way she could stand out, which is ironic considering her Latino descent should have made her different and noticeable initially. If she chose not to transform, being a nobody in the scheme of Hollywood meant she would remain obscure. Another person to fill a space, that's all. She had to cooperate. In the early days of her career, she tasted obscurity, and it scared her. Rita was signed by Fox after one of Fox's agents spotted the sultry star dancing in one of her many dance performances. Immediately she was stereotyped and only given roles of playing a non-American character. However, Fox highlighted her uniqueness and sought to make her look even more like a Latina but Fox didn't think she was profitable as the audience didn't buy into their publicity. So Fox let her go, and Columbia snapped her up. At this time she married her first husband, who was a real piece of work, calling the man her husband is being nice. He should be better described as a business partner. After all, he doubled as Rita's agent, and as some agents do, he tried to pimp her out to Columbia's top dog, Harry Cohn, who wanted to moist his phallus in the sexy actress. Of course, Rita would say no, but she couldn't say no when her slimy husband began to whisper to the studio to change Rita. The delectable woman wouldn't make money as she was. The studio needed to transform her, said her husband, Edward C. Judson. Now armed with the power of the studio, Judson began to convince his wife. Unfortunately, Rita was genuinely fearful for her career. She had spent a few years in Hollywood with nothing to show. Aside from that, owing to the actress's childhood, she became agreeable. Her father was the kind that didn't spare the rod, and Rita, due to this, didn't have enough in her at the time to say no. Just like that, she became the most cooperative girl in Hollywood. She became slimmer and had a longer face. Her treatment helped her highlight her forehead and soften her tough hair. Rita now looked like how a Hollywood star should look like. During this period, Harry Cohn made her life hell and found different ways to frustrate her. How dare Hayworth reject him, as important as he was? Thankfully, as agreeable as she was, the star wouldn't bow to Cohn's tricks. Hayworth and her story became a hit among the audience. The audience had found Hollywood stars 
to have unattainable features. Now someone who was as ordinary as they were had become created right before their eyes. The audience then began to believe that Hollywood beauty was attainable. Girls began to feel a Hollywood contract was around the corner, increasing their obsession with Hollywood. Fan obsession meant more dollars for studios, so they continued to sell Hayworth's transformation story, and people lapped it up. The audience is as much a victim as Hayworth herself. Studios collude with media houses to drive the narrative, and this particular narrative preyed on the audience's insecurity of self. Insecurity, anxiety, fear, these were the emotions Rita carried within herself. She felt like a creation, and it didn't help that this new version of her was over-sexualised. It also didn't help that the studios didn't sell Rita's new image from the point of talent or acting chops. What they were concerned about was creating a sensational sex symbol for the agreeable movie-watching audience. Lack of talent? How completely laughable. Her talent as a dancer got her a deal in the first place. Her transformation included taking weekly lessons to improve how she talked, sang and acted. Her acting lessons were even daily, but she was never allowed to showcase her talent. Instead, she was called an expert in leg art. So Hayworth questioned herself. Was she just a face for people to sexually fantasise about or an actress? The new image left her feeling insecure about herself. Her husband, that slimy man, also reminded her that she was his creation and that since he built her, he could destroy her too. She eventually separated from the man, but the damage was done to her psyche. Sometimes we wonder about the extent to which Hayworth invention went. Was the personality she also displayed a creation, or was it just Rita being herself? All we know is that Rita had boundless and infectious energy, which not many actresses had. While she was reduced to the dancing actress, people remained transfixed on the floor when she danced. Her swan-like elegance enthralled and thrilled many minds. But was this an act? She fought to keep this part of her. She wouldn't let the studio bosses take this part away from her. They had taken far too much already. With how Rita Hayworth carried her infectious energy, one would think it was all sunny for her when she was growing up. It wasn't. Rita Hayworth was born Margarita Carmen Cancino on October 17, 1918, in Brooklyn, New York, to an entertainment family. Her father was an accomplished Spanish dancer, and her mother was a vaudevillian who was a regular performer in the Ziegfeld Follies, so when it came to the arts, Rita was firmly entrenched in it. Her father trained her as a dancer, and he was brutal in training. However, he got his daughter ready for the stage at age six, and she began performing with her family. Then she began to make appearances in short films at the age of eight when her family moved towards Hollywood for better opportunities. As seasoned dancers, the Cancinos opened a dance studio in Hollywood with extra income from her father finding work as a choreographer for Hollywood films. Life was good except for Rita, who had no childhood and had to endure brutal hours of training under her father, who had a sickly obsession with his daughter's body. His hands wandered during his daughter's training, as Orson Welles revealed in different interviews. Rita travelled with dancing troops and took part in different productions, one of which put her within the scope of Fox, who gave her a contract. However, she had had enough of her father and his brutality, but to break away from her father's controlling nature, she eloped with Edward Judson, her first of five husbands. Edward worked as his wife's agent, and he was just as bad as her father, if not worse. However, even if his methods were filthy and plain wrong, he tried to grow Hayworth's career. Of course, it wasn't for Hayworth, but for himself. He got pretty nasty when Hayworth decided she had had enough of his meddling. He threw an epic tantrum. Edward saw Rita as his creation. But Rita refused to be seen as anyone's creation. At the time she left Edward, she had some B-films in her belt for Columbia, who signed her after Fox dumped her. Interestingly, it was until her transformation was nearly completed that she began to get serious roles. The first of such roles was the character she played in Only Angels Have Wings. When her opportunity came, she didn't have to take it. It didn't come because of her talent, it came because she was a sexual object that studios preyed on to make money. 
The strawberry blonde solidified Hayworth as a superstar and it marked the completion of her transformation. She became the new femme fatale. The audience wanted more of her and the studio gave them more in Blood and Sand, 1941, where she took on the role of Donna Sol. Boy, did she enthrall with that performance. Her elegance and grace screamed at the cast and the audience. There were swallows in the theatres as the sultry actress swayed with her hips. Then Fox came back for her, but she was deep in her contract with Columbia, so they got her on loan. The executives at Fox would be gnashing their teeth at missing out on such a superstar actress. Instead of getting paid per film, Columbia paid her a monthly salary, but this was what was popular at the time. Still, the actress had found her voice. That agreeable actress crumbled away, entering the outspoken Hayworth. She stirred more buzz as she played a large part in You'll Never Get Rich, 1941, a musical. Columbia returned to her roots as a musical actress. It was where her strengths lay due to her skill as a dancer. In the film, she partnered with the incredible Fred Astaire. Boy, did that film light up the cinemas. The freshness she brought was incomparable, and so the film did well with Hayworth's popularity as an actress, tearing through the roof. Due to the film's success, Hayworth got into Time magazine's cover. Astaire, a famed dancer, enjoyed dancing with the actress and felt her talent was the best he had ever seen. He also declared her to be his favourite dancing partner. Astaire was so impressed that he and Hayworth were the leading man and woman in the film You Were Never Lovelier, 1942. She also acted alongside Ginger Rogers in Tales of Manhattan. By this time, Hayworth had become everyone's favourite girl. No bachelor's home was complete without the poster of Rita wearing a nightgown as she reclined on a bed. Orson Welles and Hayworth married after she divorced Edward. The sexy star referred to Welles as the great love of my life. The two were the ideal Hollywood couple. Their marriage coincided with the time when Columbia suspended their star as she was becoming uncooperative. Hayworth had rejected a series of films, and in order to show whose boss was, the studio suspended her. It didn't matter to Hayworth, as she used this opportunity to get pregnant and give birth. After she gave birth, the studio called her back, and she returned with a bang. She did a film with Gene Kelly, Cover Girl, and Astaire came back for more of his favourite dancer in the film Gilda in 1946. Hayworth was the seductress, the femme fatale, the vamp of epic sexual proportions. Her character ensnared men with how she flicked her hair and sultrily pulled off her satin glove from her delicate fingers. Then the actress went on to act alongside her husband in the 1948 film The Lady from Shanghai. This film had her change her hairstyle and colour. Columbia bosses were enraged by what they compared to blasphemy, the auburn hair colour and lock are what set their actress apart, and Orson had just made her take the oversaturated blonde path. The film was a financial flop. Some claimed it was because of Hayworth's new look, which shocked the audience. However, look or not, the delectable Rita had a spectacular performance, and this film marked the end of her relationship with Orson. Hayworth had peaked, and her next releases didn't give that initial bang again. It was as if working with Wells infected her with the box office flop terrible luck. It seemed the audience no longer cared about her hair, as it mostly returned to the style the audience loved. The actress transcended her usual self with her performance in Gilda, and all her subsequent films didn't reach that height. Her feeling of insecurity and anxiety returned. To combat this, the actress took a break and travelled to Europe, where she hooked up with Prince Ali Khan, a notorious playboy. The two courted and married. The love goddess turned into a princess. The two had a child together, Princess Yasmin Aga Khan. But being a star didn't prepare Hayworth for the publicity and the extravagance of a royal lifestyle. Unfortunately, love wasn't enough as her personal life had lost all sense of privacy. The pressure of being associated with a royal ruined their marriage, and despite trying to make it work, they couldn't. Her return to Hollywood was unglamorous, as her next film also bombed at the box office, with fans comparing it to Gilda again. They called the new film Affair in Trinidad, a Gilda wannabe. Then she cranked up her sexuality in Salome in order to recapture the audience, but she didn't. Then she disappeared again, with rumours saying she was suspended again. 
She married and divorced singer Dick Haynes within a year, and it was a messy divorce in which a custody battle followed. Hayworth would fight another battle soon enough. The battle of her life. Her return after her 1953 break had her acting alongside quality acting stars, Robert Mitchum, Jack Lemmon and the scintillating Frank Sinatra. However, her time had come to an end. Columbia had prepared her replacement, which meant her time with them was over. The actress left the studio and tried again for love. This time she married a film producer, James Hill, and the two worked together for two films, Separate Tables and The Happy Thieves. The two soon divorced. Then she acted alongside the incredible John Wayne in 1964's Circus World. At this point the actress began to change. She became absent-minded and forgetful. Easily everyone called the actress an alcoholic, and it wasn't until later that she was correctly diagnosed for having Alzheimer's. Still, the actress didn't stop acting. For someone who had lost herself due to success, Alzheimer's came for what was left, and it ate at her, one piece at a time, until the only thing left for it to take was her life. Love remained elusive for the actress till death, and she led a lonely older life with her only company being her second daughter, Princess Yasmin. Hayworth, despite the insecurity she felt about her talent, grew to learn about her self-worth. She starred in an Oscar-nominated film, Separate Tables, 1958, and got a Golden Globe nomination for Circus World. So, now that you have seen how Rita lost herself, we ask, how much is success worth to you? If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Maybe Rita Hayworth changed or even lost her identity, but can you imagine... Audrey Hepburn betraying herself. How? Watch this video.